Okay, so remember this is interactive. We're all here to learn from each other, to answer each other's questions. So please go to the website app, go to your profile, and you'll be able to find in the top left-hand corner, Slido Q&A. Click into that and choose the right stage. SAS Monster, the best stage of all, of course. Now, today we're going to be talking about future as a service, uh, how to scale optimally, digital transformation with some amazing founders. But right now, I'm going to introduce you to the founders and CEOs of companies that have that have gotten to that have raised over 30 million dollars, upwards of 30 million dollars, have hundreds of employees, and have a really, really uh, sterling group of brands uh, on their uh, enterprise customer list. So this is where we all want to get to. So how do we manage that type of scaling? How do we scale at the right pace? Because it's very easy to start scaling too fast. So to share their wisdom on managing your scaling, we have in conversation with Techstars, Connor Murphy, the CEO and co-founder of Periscope Data, Harry Glazer, the co-founder and CEO of Launch Darkly, Edith Harbaugh, and the co-founder and CEO of Algolia, Nicola Desenia. Please give them a very warm round of applause. Can you hear us? Yeah? We're live. Um, delighted to be here today and to help introduce this panel. Um, we're talking about from fast to sustainable growth. But I think before we do that, let's find out who's behind that growth. And let's have very brief 30 second introductions from the panel, starting with Edith. Hey, I'm Edith Harba. I'm CEO and co founder of Launch Darkly. We're a feature management platform that's used uh, by customers worldwide, including Slido, who you're using an app for today. Uh, also plural site at Atlassian. Uh, it's super fun for me to be here because we actually started out as one of the companies at Alpha uh, with the plywood booth when we were a two-person company. Awesome. Excellent. That's uh, fast. <laughs> Nicholas, uh, co-founder and CEO of Algolia. We are a search and discovery platform. We help developers of companies like Medium, uh, Twitch, uh, Under Armour uh, to deliver a great search experience inside their own website or app. Uh, we also were an alpha company years ago here. Uh, we, are, we are 300 people now. Uh, we were only 150 a year ago. I'm Harry, I'm co-founder and CEO of Periscope Data. Uh, we make an analytics platform that's a unified platform for your data analysts, your data scientists, your data engineers to collaborate, drive your company growth together. Uh, we have about 1,000 customers, including Uber, HBO, New Relic, and, uh, and we're Algolia customers, in fact. Awesome. Um, and we're about 150 people, about 1,000 customers, all in San Francisco. Awesome. So I'm pretty sure when you go to Web Summit website next time and you go to the Alpha page, you're going to see both of your quotes uh, as great testimonials for Alpha. I'm sure Paddy, Paddy, if he's listening, is delighted with that. So that's awesome. It's great to have you guys back at Web Summit. But specifically to this topic, I know we mentioned we can take questions from the audience as well. But just to start off, what, is, what does growth mean for you or all of you? And what, we were chatting earlier before we uh, came on stage. Is it fast growth or sustainable growth? What's the difference? Is it and or? And uh, what does growth mean to you guys? And what does sustainable growth mean to you? Maybe eat it. Uh, so growth for us, I mean, the number one thing we look at is growth in customers, growth in revenue. So we're doing about 3x in revenue right now. Uh, for a long time, though, we had very sustainable growth. And that, I mean, we're a new category and a new company, so for a while we were getting one customer a month. Which basically meant that in my mind we were doubling. Uh, <laughs> if you go from one to two, that's a double. Yeah. Um, now we're getting, you know, as I said, triple, and I think what really helps us is that we had this stage where every customer was very precious. Every customer meant a lot to us. You got a, a visit from me or a CTO. So now we're really set up for fast, sustainable growth because we have very low churn. So the, the difference there is sustainable was that you could actually, was that like the unscalable service part where you kind of got to know the companies really well, your first customers, you had a really deep relationship with them? 
Okay. Yeah, like our, our, our first customers, I knew them by name. They, they, they knew us, we knew them, and I, we, they didn't really know that the, one of the reasons we knew them so well is that we, we, we needed to. Uh, I love it as well. I just think I work with tech stars, a lot of early stage companies, so when they're not having explosive growth, I'm going to tell them, pitch, we have really strong sustainable growth right now, so I like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess we are all uh, VC-backed companies yeah. here, so I guess we have like a specific way to look at sustainable growth. Uh, for me, let's grow as fast as we can, yeah. as long as we have a path to profitability. So the idea there is more, as long as I know that uh, I can stop investing and become profitable before running out of money, I mean, the, I want to invest in growth. I want to uh, grow as fast as I can. Uh, it's just uh, the, the notion of sustainable for me, it's more about like making sure that that growth is not lost later on, is not going to lead me to have to fire people if we don't make it. Actually, what, one thing we spoke about before coming on stage, which I think is relevant, that is also the strategic decisions he made, like I asked you to do on-prem. Yeah. And you talked about how on-prem yeah. wouldn't would actually slow down your growth. In the short term, you might make yeah. sales in this month and quarter, but it actually, you were saying long term, it would actually slow down your yeah. business. So. Yeah, from the, from the day one, we decided not to do on-prem. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and business-wise, revenue-wise, it was uh, definitely uh, easier to do on-premise. But we wanted to bet on the market of tomorrow, yes. not yeah. the market of today. Yeah. Uh, even if today revenue could be easier to do, well, five years ago, could be easier yeah. to make in on-prem. I uh, wanted to make sure we designed the right product for the market of the future. Yeah. Okay. And that led us to do, uh, and I think that's indeed kind of sustainable yeah. growth, even if it's slightly sour, slower, we knew it was more sustainable. Yeah, so it's not growed at all costs, it's yes. growed at, yeah. Okay. There's a, I mean, uh, the goal at the end of the day as a business, right, is to generate cash flow. At some point in the, in the far future, we want this business to be profitable and generating cash for its shareholders and its employees and all that stuff. And so there's a couple of transitions you go through, and I think Edith touched on the first one, which is at some point, you, what growth, sustainable growth means actually from customers, from revenue, and that's relatively early on in the customers, in the company's life, that becomes what growth means. And then also, you know, in this kind of growth stage that I think we're all in, you're burning capital in order to grow very fast, doubling, tripling. Um, and then you make a transition to at least have a path to cash flow positive. And I, I think these days that's typically, you know, right around before or after the IPO, where you go, okay, we're going to slow the growth rate and do it much more profitably and get to profitable. And that's a decision I think every, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly when you do that, but there's a, that's a uh, decision a lot of management teams go through as you get to scale mode is, okay, when do you start transitioning from grow really, really fast and burn capital to get to profitable and grow a little bit slower? Yeah. yeah. So, so you said something really interesting about betting big on the cloud, because mm -hmm. we made the same bet, and it was really slow for a long time, but yep. the thing I remembered was what my mentor, Sean Burns, had said, which is, if you're not way out in the water when the wave hits, you're too late. Yep. Yep. Like, you gotta, you gotta be out there on your surfboard paddling, and then when the wave comes, you can have you can explosive grow growth. The, the other thing, maybe quickly on what you said, is that when you speak about 2x, uh, it's not, you have to, uh, to consider it's exponential. It's not 2x and then you continue to grow like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2x yeah. every year is like basically doubling the business. Yep. And that's uh, exponential, which means that uh, how much you are going to have to invest, to burn, to keep that growth, yep. uh, all the, the constraints on the company, all of that expon is exponential too, including constraint of founders. Uh, you need to grow as fast as the business grows. It's also, I mean, to touch on both of what you said, I mean, a lot of us are in markets that are emerging right now. Yeah. Like for us, uh, data scientists, I think growth in data scientists job roles is 20x over the last four years. And so this is our moment as a company. And so it makes sense to burn a bunch of capital uh, to grow really fast to maximize that opportunity because it won't be around forever, right? If we wait and grow slower, somebody else may capture the opportunity. They, they may do a less good job serving customers and we don't want that. So it makes sense to uh, grow really fast right now because this is our moment and the wave is coming, right? Have, yeah. you, have you consciously ever slowed down anything? We're all talking about growth, but do you, have you consciously gone slower on certain things? Or have you spoke to your investors, your teams are slowing down or pulling back from certain areas? Um, the only, uh, the only uh, memory I have is that when we raised the World Series A, that was 2015, our investor back then told us that our plan for the year was too aggressive. Hmm. Okay. Wow. It didn't change anything about the plan, except he was right, of course, and we basically reached, uh, like we did 4X that year, which was great by many standards, but we didn't know how difficult it would be before doing it. 
but no, since then it's never happened. We never like slowed down really. It's more like how can you choose where you invest yeah. more than slowing down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. Go yeah. Ahead, go ahead. When, when you um, the faster you grow, generally, like the less efficient you are. <laughs> so uh, you know maybe getting a marketing lead costs you five dollars. You know, so that's five dollar cost per lead. Uh, getting 100 marketing leads, it might cost you $7 per lead. Getting 200 marketing leads might cost you $9 per lead. Um, and so generally, the faster you try to grow, the less efficient it is. And there's a point at which it no longer makes sense, yeah. right? It's like, okay, this is a really unprofitable way to acquire customers. Let's not do that. Let's scale it back a little bit and grow a little less fast. Um, and we've certainly encountered the limits of that, of that growth rate and made a decision to, okay, we're not going to grow that fast because it's just way too inefficient to do that and way too expensive. Yeah, for us, it was really about scaling our core system. So the transition we had is that people started to move from feature branching and shipping once a quarter to feature flagging and shipping multiple times a day. So we grew from doing a billion flags a day, which seemed like a huge amount, to we do 50 to 80 billion on a daily basis. So for about six months, we had to really prioritize making sure that the system scaled, that we were rock solid, that we could continue to deliver several nines of service. And we were not putting out huge new features then, but the huge new feature was that our system worked. Yeah. So you work on your, your backlog. It was yeah. like, okay, we're not yeah. going to push innovation. We're going to get the backlog. Yeah. Prioritize this next two, three sprints. Kind of there's, there's absolutely a scale where your customers stop forgiving screw ups like that. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're, when you're small and you have 10 customers or 50 customers and you're just pounding out features and growing as fast as you can and the system sometimes goes down and they, they forgive that. You have a thousand customers, HBO does not forgive that, right? Yeah. That's not okay. And so, yeah, you make a decision to scale back the rate of feature development to make sure everything is really stable. But, but that in and itself is a feature because then you get HBO who's like, I can trust you. Right, absolutely, it's great. Awesome. Maybe one see quickly on the investment. It's yeah. not always dollars that is your limiting factor. Uh, sometimes it's simply the time the leadership can dedicate to that. Yep. We're speaking uh, of uh, uh, expansion in new countries before. Uh, we are looking at next year and we are planning to expand in Japan. The limiting factor is not cash. Yeah. It's especially today when like, like you, we can all do pretty good rounds of funding. No, it's the time of the founders of the leadership team. Because yeah. if you open a new country, you have to travel there. Yeah. That's an opportunity cost for something else. And that can slow, slow, down you, uh, like slow you down. And just on that, when you touched on the point in uh, the founding team, and we, we'll open up the questions probably after this one, um, and I see them coming in, so please have the questions coming in. You can vote up the questions. But the founding team, how are we as founders, if you're growing your company 3x, you're growing your team from 10, 20 to 50 to 100 to 300 people, how are you scaling? How are you making that sustainable as individual leaders, as a true coaching? Uh, how have you managed that personal transition, maybe starting, starting with Harry? Yeah, so um, I think Nicholas said something backstage that's exactly right, which is the job as CEO and probably all the co-founders changes completely every yeah. six months. And so the, the real lesson is you embrace that. Like you're signed up for this journey where you are constantly learning the next job. And if you're still doing the last job, you're probably holding the team and the company back. Um, my very favorite thing in terms of coping with it is uh, peer groups of CEOs, um, especially for jealously, like I like, um, or selfishly, I like um, CEOs that are one stage ahead of me. And they will have a really good um, perspective on what I'm going through and how they got through it. And so I really appreciate that. Um, your board and your investors can be helpful too, I think. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, well, so to that, the reason why I'm on the panel with you two is I both look up to both of you, <laughs> and you have given me so much <laughs> advice over the years. So I am, I've definitely benefited from people a stage or two beyond me. And, and also what Harry said, um, to kind of embrace the change. Like when we closed our A, we were eight people. And what I told the team is everything we did to get here, we're going to change, and that's going to be really fun. Like the way we ran the team now is very, very different. But as long as you say, hey, this is a journey, we're in it together and not something to be afraid of. Yeah, I cannot agree more with both of what you said. Uh, the thing is that uh, as we're seeing company grow exponentially, as people, we usually grow linearly. So we have like, it's like kind of like a big gap between the pace of learnings you can get by default and the needs of the company. So you really need to double invest on yourself, uh, take every opportunity to learn. Uh, that can be from peers, which is probably one of the best source of learnings. Uh, coach, I waited way too long to uh, have a coach. Uh, make yourself more efficient too. Uh, hire an EA, we're discussing <laughs> about that too. Uh, like 
don't wait to be uh, 300 people to hire an EA. Uh, they are going to make you so much more efficient. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, come and learn from all your peers, like hire better people that are more experienced than you are in your scale to join your exec team. Yeah. That's one of the big learnings too. When you start a company, you are looking for generalists that have a huge potential. At some stage, you need to shift that and start searching from experts who have done it before. You don't have a choice if you want to continue to scale at that pace. Yeah. And to that point then, I think the, the first question here that's trending that I think is aligned with as you scale individually, uh, how, do you, um, how are you going to retain company culture while it's growing? So how do you shape that, maintain that, or how do you ad adjust your culture? Can you adjust your culture as you grow? So advice I got was that your company culture is as strong as the last person you hired. Okay. So they know none of the history, they know none of how you got here. So one thing we do with all new hires is I do an hour long session of our history and values. Individually or as a group? As a group? Uh, with, yeah. with the people hired in the last um, three weeks, yeah. like the last one was about eight people. And I sit down and I say, hey, here's how we started. Here are our values. Here's where our values came from. And by the way, this is not a lecture because that's boring for me. This is your chance to ask questions about our history. And like just a lot of stuff I assume people know, they're brand new and they don't. Yeah. yeah when, uh, I mean, basically half the people you have in the team were not with you a year before. Yeah. So you cannot expect them to know who you are. And, uh, and doubling the team, uh, and for us today, that was like 150 people that are new in the last yeah. 12 months. That completely changed the culture if you are not intentional. So you need to be very intentional. I did that session last week in Paris yeah. with like a bunch of new hires. Uh, but you need to repeat and repeat and repeat again uh, why you're here, your mission, your culture, your values. You need to be as transparent uh, as you can, like put some structure in place. Uh, OKRs, yeah. we were speaking about, yeah. make sure people are all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. Communication, over communicate. And all of that, I mean, in the early days, doesn't matter as much uh, because, I mean, you know everyone, you can all sit around the table, but at some point you have multiple offices, you have a distant time zone. I mean, you don't have a choice. You need and to you've got French, you've, got, you've also kind of got more San Francisco based teams, but you also have, you have a European team and yeah, San Francisco, yeah. you have multi, multi you have five cultural offices, backgrounds. Yeah, <laughs> five offices, but the French office is the biggest one. We have all our engineering there. Yeah. Uh, we're headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, so we have, by default, like so many culture, so many backgrounds of people. Mm -hmm. That's huge, that's so good. Uh, but at the same time, you want to build one company, yeah. one global company, yeah. and that comes from culture, from company culture. I also think that the culture is going to change as you scale. It yeah. just is. Yeah. And it's important to be intentional about yeah. it, and it's also important to tell the company that that's going to happen. One of the bad things that can happen is people get attached to the way decisions were made when you're 10 yeah. people, or the way information was shared when you're 10 people, or what have you, and then they become a little bit toxic as they try to hang on to that yeah. while the company is scaling past them. And usually, what you can do is, to your point about repetition, um, just say over and over again, we're going to go through some changes. Here's where we're going to go. Here's why we're going to go there. And just tell them that it's OK and that it's natural and that it's we, what we want to do. And they'll get on board with that. Then you can control the cultural growth instead of just having it sort of scale past you. Yeah. yeah. What, what I tell people is that culture continues to happen. Like one of our, <laughs> yeah. one of our solution engineers, Lev, he once said he wishes he was part of the company, the glory days of launch darkly. <laughs> and I said, no, the glory days are here and still ahead. Like yeah. now is where we're tripling. Yeah. Now is where everything good is happening. Don't, don't idealize some past. So, so one, one thing you can do is to split uh, who you are from how you work. Who you are, like the core values of the company, mm -hmm. may not need to change that much. Yep. Yeah. How you work needs to change every day. Mm. You cannot work the same at 150 yeah. that you were working at 10 people. It's, there's yeah. no way it can work. So we have time for one more question, very quick one, I think. Uh, do you have any choice which one of those top three questions you want, or do you want me to pick them? Or is there a question you, we haven't? I like, yeah, I like the one. The, the second one is, um, you know, when you're small, you hire people, their owners, they want to build this with you. Um, and then, yeah, as you, get, as you get bigger, some of the people you hire, I mean, they're still mission driven, but they're not taking that crazy risk that the early people took. Um, and it is in some ways a little bit more of a job. Um, I think that the biggest thing that goes wrong at this stage, to be totally honest, is the founders not coming to grips with that mm. and having unrealistic expectations about what the 300th person at the company's um, level of investment in the company is going to be relative to the first two or three or five people. 
and, uh, and driving people into the wall or, or micromanaging them in the same way as you sort of worked with the team in the early days. Is, is there a point where that happens? Do you think, was there 50, 100, 150? In the last five, I think it's seconds. I think it's gradual, and I think yeah. you just accept that as you get bigger, the different types of people that you hire and the way that those people work together is going to change, and that's growth for you as a founder, right? You think about okay, I'm going to work with this team differently. I'm not going to be going out for beers after work with this team every day because that's going to be as weird for them as it would be for me, <laughs> and that's just going to be different than it was when we were five people. So we're killing the sustainable growth of the timing here. We just got 30 <laughs> seconds <laughs> over. But hopefully it wasn't too fast. Hopefully it was useful for everyone. And thank you for all of the questions and thank you for the panelists for their time and insights. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you.